welcome to A Problem Squared. If this podcast was the first Matrix movie, you, the listener, would be Neo, a computer nerd who seeks answers from strangers on the internet to avoid doing their actual job. I'm joined by our Morpheus, Matt Parker, who enjoys long-winded explanations, suits a shaved head, and is arguably the leader of a cult. And I'm the Oracle, Beck Hill, in that my baseless advice is accurate, but unhelpful. I work from home, and I will encourage kids to break cutlery. I think that might be the best introduction ever. Like, that was <laughs> consistently good. It'd be even better if you started wearing glasses that didn't have frames. Oh, I should just suspend them. Yeah. I was going to say, I do enjoy watching old-timey televisions in a white void. So, you know, a lot of this <laughs> so much. lines up. I can't believe I never, never saw the similarities beforehand. Well, there you go. Welcome aboard, everyone. And I suspect a decent percentage of our listeners are doing this to avoid work. Yeah. So that's I, I guess that notch. makes our yep. producer, Lauren, the architect. I imagine she looks like Colonel Sanders looking at a ton of screens. Also, she starts mysterious and becomes more and more contrived as the series goes on. <laughs> Sorry, Lauren. She just said that's spot on. Yeah, she agreed with us wholeheartedly. <laughs> Do any of us get cut the fourth one when that's being made? I mean... I wrote a fourth one. Did you? When like I was fanfic. when I was uh, like fourteen or fifteen. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, it was great. We filmed it as well. It's all out of sequence. Um, it's all on the uh, little tapes back at it's home. Remade with no, it cows. wasn't even that clever. No. It was just us remaking it with lots of like uh, the Nebuchadnezzar was the Mitsubishi Kinezo, which was just my mum's car. And then when you went into the Matrix, you just like put the seat back. <laughs> Then we just put tapes into the tape deck and we'd wrote like ninjutsu on them. So it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, we, we were brilliant. Made sense. We did closing credits one time by filming a bit of paper and then using the dimmer switch on the lights in the room. Oh, great. To fade in and out on names. Oh, yeah. that's that's really enjoyable. <laughs> with with High tech. With, I look at TikTok and I'm like, what? Kids these how days. Do they, how do they do that with thing? Their eye movies. Yeah. They must have spent ages with the VCR. <laughs> Matt, what have, what have you been up to in, in the last month? I have had people sending me math things. That's been the theme of my month. I thought you that was your life normally. It is my life. It is my life. But you know how I was discussing previously, I had too many videos in production and I'm trying to get them all out and I'm meant to be writing a book. And all these other things. And then I was like starting to come to the end of my videos. And two people were just like, oh, here's a new prime number. And someone else emailed me and said, hey, here's a new dodecahedron. And I'm like, people, I'm trying to take a break. You know what? You can choose. Beck? Oh, yeah. Do you want to hear about the new prime number someone sent me? Or do you want to hear about the new dodecahedron someone sent me? There's your options. I think I need the new prime number because I'm not sure why you wouldn't just know that. Yeah. Why aren't they just all known? It's a good question. They're not all known because there's a lot of them and they're very, very big. And so some people try to calculate the biggest possible prime number. It's the big competition for who can find the biggest prime number. And there's always a bigger one. Like there's infinitely many of these things. So yeah. People try to find a big one, big one, big one. And actually... The one someone sent me is not the biggest one. They've got tens of millions of digits, the biggest primes were found. And we're overdue one. It's not quite the biggest gap ever, but it's currently the second biggest gap in modern computing history between finding record-breaking prime numbers. And so I'm like, it's due any moment now, there's going to be another one. But The audience can't said, see this, but a smile has just slowly been spreading across my face as I... It's true. Uh, Listen to this without any uh, prime prior. Numbers. Uh, however, the one that someone sent me is only 4,030 digits long, which is a big number, but it's reasonably yes. small in terms of prime numbers. And people try to find in between ones because they have interesting properties. And I made a video about a thing called a widely digitally delicate prime number, which is a prime number where if you change any of the digits, it will no longer be a prime number. If you change any of the digits to any other value, it's guaranteed to now be a multiple of something. It's no longer prime. And that includes the infinitely many zeros at the beginning. Because all numbers have infinitely many lead zeros. We just don't bother writing right. down. 
only this year we managed to prove the existence of these numbers and there's infinitely many of them and they're consecutive and all these wonderful things. But finding one is just beyond what's possible at the moment. And then in the video, I'm like, oh, but we managed to prove they exist, but no one's ever found one. And then someone dropped me an email after my video went out and said, hey, I uh, saw this research when it came out. I got curious about it. I got in touch with the authors of the paper, the people who did the maths. And I was like, ah, oh, that's a bit annoying. We haven't found one. Let's do it. And they did it. Someone found one. And I can't tell you how right. insane that is. 4,030 digits. Unbelievable. There you are. That's... You asked how things are going for me. Great. Did they get it named after them? Well, you don't really name prime numbers. That's a good point. Oh. So a lot of What's maths... the point of finding them then? Uh, it's, it's true. Why? Fame. You get to appear in a stand-up math YouTube video. I mean, what more do people want? <laughs> so it starts 903963 and then goes and goes and goes and goes. No, and the last say, digit alert. is a nine. Oh, so I've ruined the ending. Ruined. Yeah. It ends 5399249. There you go. So Have you tried calling it. Let's just start, start typing at the beginning and see what happens. Yeah. I've not even I've not even scrolled through to find my favorite bit. I mean uh, no, I can't I'm, I'm just that. lost in it now. Keep Oh, oh wow. Matt, stop looking at the number. Three zeros Come back. On the way. So, b Beck, what have you pos what have you done this month that can possibly rival, <laughs> rival, and uh, I found I two prime numbers. Uh, two. Whoa! I stand. Yeah. I stand. Stand down. We interrupt this update to bring you an update. Hello, Beck Hill here. Just after we recorded this episode, I found out that my new arts and crafts TV show has an air date. Hooray! So I didn't want you guys to miss it in case you wanted to watch it. It starts on CITV at 5.30pm on September the 6th. So that's Monday, September the 6th at 5.30pm on CITV. So please check it out. That's Makeaway Takeaway. And I'll let you get back to the show. I'm sure Matt and I will talk about this more in the next episode. I just didn't want you to miss it. Bye! How's your month been? Yeah, Come on. In the back of the it... cupboard. Uh, my, oh, Matt. Beck. I went to the most amazing Hindu. <laughs> we were, oh. this is the, well, almost the opposite of your month. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, first of all, I'm prepared I should to say accept that. We were all incredibly, uh, we all had our tests done, did all of the measures all possible. The yep. And we stayed in a decommissioned Royal Observer Corp bunker. A bunker. Like, like a an, headquarters. Like an underground. From like the Cold War. Like a nuclear bunker. Uh, yeah, well, it was there to observe uh, if there were was nuclear bombs and stuff happening. They would communicate with other gotcha. bunkers so, and triangulate where the bombs had gone off. Don't try and distract me with triangles. So when <laughs> you you arrive, can you see anything above ground? Is it like an above ground concrete structure? or do you like, like a shed. Like a shed. It looks like a it looks like a shed in the back. So you stayed in a shed, with like pebble cladding on it. <laughs> what a Hindu! There, but there is also there's like a little hatch as well. You can go down the hatch, oh. but the shed entrance well, is safer because there's oh, steps. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. I thought for a second you just had an Airbnb, which is like a pebble dash terraced house somewhere. And they're like, oh no, it's a, it's a royal observing no, no, no. bunker. It's a charitable organisation, and oh. they're trying to restore this bunker. Using all of these old photos. Back when it was bunking. But yeah. oh my gosh, Matt, you would have been in your element. It's the first time that sentence is true when said about a Hindu. Oh, they, they had this computer that they couldn't work out what language it oh. talked in. So they're going to have to like oh, teach don't. it to speak another language oh. to work out what the computer's used oh my for. Goodness. Because they actually. Don't, yeah, don't taunt me. They had like light up perspex maps, graphs. So that it's sort like, of thing. like a hands on. There was like museum. sirens. And we stayed in these oh. dorms. In the actual bunker bunk beds. Bunker bunker uh, bunk so beds. Incredible. And it's not traditionally used for Hindus That's and things. Amazing. But oh, it was so much fun. We got to do this massive tour, find out loads about it. I got uh, 
safely inebriated <laughs> <laughs> and um, at about 1am decided to make a scavenger hunt. Classic. Had a few drinks, and Beck. all the hens, yeah. they're well up for it. And I couldn't believe how much they remembered because I'd stopped drinking. The bunk but hunt. But they, they kept going. Wow. The bunk hunt. <laughs> Maybe don't say that. Oh, okay. Mm, weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say oh. how disappointed I am that I was not invited. Not to the Hindu, well, just to come and see the computer. Got... <laughs> we might have to... Uh, yeah. Perhaps we should arrange some sort of a problem squared recording. On location from the bunker. Live at the bunker. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, I'm always hesitant to overpromise for fear of under-delivering, but I really feel like... I, d I don't want to put a time frame on it, but let's do it. <laughs> Speak it, podcast. On this episode, writing tips, citing tips, biting tips. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Best menu ever. We're basically, moved yeah. for this episode. <laughs> our first problem was sent in by one of our Patreon supporters on the problem posing page at a problem squared.com. James here is very concise with their problem. They simply say, how to avoid burning out with writing and ways to keep it fun and interesting. And then there's no full stop at the end. There's no punctuation. James got bored writing that sentence. So I sense this is a pressing <laughs> issue. And uh, Beck, I believe you've got a solution. Yes, I do. I do have a solution because Matt, you and I, we both write a lot. It's part of our job. Professional authors. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, my, my books haven't come out yet. Uh, by the time you're listening to this, it's a month away until my book comes out. Very exciting. I've now switched. Sometimes if I'm asked what I do for a living, like at um, customs or whatever, you know, immigration, I say author. It's just a much quicker answer than any other way to describe what I do for a living. What, what are the other things that you've said? Math teacher is yeah. a good one. But then there's often questions and I feel like that's bordering on... Um, Lying. People ask questions to math teachers. how long it's been since I was a real teacher. I'd be like, oh, okay, don't tell me anything oh, else. Oh, you'd be amazed. Keep going. No, no. Well, you would not make a good immigration officer. I've had... Oh, do they test you? The ones in Australia have told me off for not teaching in Australia ah. anymore. People in the UK have asked me for advice for their kids' A-level choices. <laughs> ones in America have asked why I'm here, if it's when are the holidays... A lot of follow-on questions for math teacher. And so author, nothing. So for me, when I'm writing, because I started out writing scripts, that's my background. And that's a lot easier mm -hmm. for me to write because I write predominantly for children's animated shows, which are normally somewhere between seven and 16 minutes long. I mean, even if a full episode is nearing half an hour they're normally made up of two smaller episodes so like spongebob was always that way you've always got sort of two yep. shorter ones and i don't really get as bored writing them because they're short <laughs> so you can sort of <laughs> you know you can bosh out a first draft in a day and then the rest mm. is just tweaking yep. so that's really enjoyable but these books that i'm writing at the moment the horror heights books they're Still relatively short by book standards. They're, how many, how many they're words? Just over 20,000. <laughs> but they're narratives, which is... Wow. Uh, 20,000. To me, that's a lot, Matt. He's <laughs> giving me this it real is a lot. It's a lot. It's definitely a lot. Grin. And I'm being a real smug jerk, but I'll be honest, I couldn't do it. And because my books are between 80 and 120,000. Yeah, but 000, I could write that if I was just reference. saying the truth. Try lying for... Well, this is it, see? Bingo. I know. And I'm like, I think fiction yeah. 20 is the equivalent of non-fiction I say lying. I, think that, I should actually clarify. Exchange rate. Uh, my, the, these books are actually based on true stories, but I've decided to fictionalise them, which is, is just as difficult because then That's you're trying you. to create this atmosphere by putting the uh, reader you're lying about the in, truth. The, in the moment. So you're sort of having to think about what was really happening at the time and, and, and how it all worked. Uh, and also what the truth might be, because honestly, these stories are all based on, on largely reports and hearsay. So <laughs> who knows? Yeah. No, nah, not me. I'm just fact, 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 fact. That's me yeah. typing. Just banging, just banging out, out facts. facts. Occasionally deducing a new fact, leaving a fact for the reader to work out themselves. Yeah. Piece of cake. So for me personally, 
the first book I found very easy to write and then later realized how many mistakes I'd made <laughs> and then had to sort of fix it. Uh, <laughs> Arguably, you hadn't finished writing yeah, it yet. Yeah, yeah, because you think it's just starting from the beginning and then and then finishing writing and saying the end. Yeah, but it's not. It's in the, the it's end. in the tweaks. No, I realised that that writing is essentially making something broken very quickly and then spending a long time yeah. fixing it. It's yeah, but you need to start with and something. The problem to is, hone. is that. If you spend ages trying to have it perfect, you'll spend more time doing that, trying to get it perfect the first time round, yeah. than just as, d just accepting that it's broken. And uh, if we're generalizing to just generic writing advice, as opposed to keeping it exciting, well, maybe this helps. For me, it does, in terms of keeping it exciting, is I know the first, not even draft, but the first phase of writing for me is just generating words. And I find that very liberating. It's like collecting all the Lego pieces so that you could actually make the thing out of Lego. Exactly. And, and a lot of the time, if you are worried about it being good or you're not quite sure, it, it'll stifle yeah. you. You'll be trapped. You'll be paralyzed for wanting to make it perfect. And it stops it from being fun. Yeah. Because I, when I think about it, for me, like, I love playing pool or darts. Like, I love bar games, pub games. Okay. Bit of a segue, but Karen. I'm not good at those things. Oh. I'm I'm all right. But what will tend what will usually happen is I'll have a couple of shots at the beginning, either at pool, not the, the drinks. I mean, I'll have a go at either pool or darts, and I'll do surprisingly well. And people go, oh, and then it's all downhill from there. And then I will I don't think we've ever played pool, but I don't think we have. We've played table tennis in a in a in a bar. We have, yeah. That's probably the Not same cool. as well. Most games, I will do start okay strong. the first. I'll start strong and then, and then but wane. I will lose. <laughs> Card games, anything. I, I will lose, but I'm okay with that because my confidence in myself doesn't lie in my ability to play pool or darts. I know that I'm good <laughs> yep, at other yep. things. And I think writing needs to be approached with very much the same feeling, mm. which is that you have to be okay to technically lose <laughs> you have to be sometimes fine with the that. book will be winning <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> and then you know later you can sort of go oh how should i have done that <laughs> and that's when you get but that's the that's the great thing about it you know is that you get to go back and do that and fix it later so that's uh that's one piece of advice i've got a few other little ones which are probably just more suited to me, but anyone listening, they might find it interesting. Yeah. Sometimes I'll wear different coloured, like, you know, the 3D glasses. This yeah. is just specific so that are to you. Right. Me. Wow. Yeah. Um, I'll switch up Love the it. font. Oh, whoa. Love switching up the font. I have never in my life switched up the font. Oh, have you ever written in Comic Sans? I have every single book I've written has been written in Verdana. Without exception. That doesn't surprise me. Imagine writing in Comic Sans. Uh, well, Comic Sans was was uh, created to help people with dyslexia. The point is that the letters aren't completely symmetrical so that your eyes are able to differentiate them more easily. Obviously, sometimes people use Comic Sans because they see the word comic and they're like, oh, that applies to it's either co comedy yeah. or comic books. And they're wrong. But, <laughs> but other times... You'll see it used in, in certain other things, and it is because it is easier to easier read. Easier process. Yeah. So you're, yeah. You're on board. Yeah. So I've written in Comic Sans a few times. I've done that. Good advice. Another thing that I've been doing to make writing more fun, and this is very specific to me, but might be interesting to some other people, I bought a an Onyx Books, which is an e-ink oh, tablet. Oh. On some of their tablets, you can connect a Bluetooth keyboard. So... I've actually been writing the entire book too with my e-ink tablet on landscape and I bought a Bluetooth keyboard that clackety clacks like a typewriter. Oh, yep. You just go to clackety clack clack and then yeah, it feels like you're typing on a typewriter but you can delete stuff. I very much enjoy it and it does make writing a lot more fun. It makes it feel a bit more special, yeah. magical. Yeah. Tactile, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think things like that, they make they make writing more fun. I have a bunch of like fidget toys and it's probably the fact that I'm not writing much at the moment. I was looking around, often I've got a Nerf gun within um, 
range or like uh, juggling balls or something like things I can just play with and I like to throw but I don't know why but for some reason when I'm writing I like to throw things in the air and catch them that just kind of oh yeah tactile movement I that's what I do and I, I don't know why that for some spinner. reason yeah, that Not kind of stuff. It gives my brain... I can concentrate for longer if I'm messing around mm. physically at the same time. And leaning right I, back in my chair. This is my writing position like this. I'm like, yeah. That's leaning back. What should he's, I... What fact He's leaning I put so in far back... That's me. I can see he's not wearing any trousers, which is a callback to I'm a wizard. <laughs> callback to the other podcast. <laughs> no context. <laughs> That's um, how you keep well, writing got, exciting. References to uh, things. The yeah, in jokes. In jokes. In That's jokes. what keeps. To be People fair, love in jokes. I don't putting understand. in jokes in something does make it more fun and makes it feel more special. I think it's very much about doing the things that would excite you as a kid and making it more fun that way, making it feel like a special adventure. And in terms of to avoid burning out, uh, which was one other thing that James mentioned, and I'll, I'll finish up on this, is that you shouldn't really write for more than three or four hours at a time, which is advice that I've been given by several authors, and I'm inclined to agree. I find what tends to happen is if I start to write over four hours, I will then write at about 15% of the productivity that I was yep. at for the first four and you need to do that because then you're not exhausting yourself of everything that you have. You know, it's like, uh, it's a common term I, I've uh, referred to a few times, but it's uh, filling the well, which is the, you know, the idea that you draw from the well when you're writing, yep. but if you don't you take time to refill it, you've got nothing to draw out anymore. So You'll it's lower really your important. groundwater table. Yeah. yeah, stop, go outside, go for a walk spend the rest of the day doing other things because when you come back the next day, you'll be five times more productive. I forget where I first saw this advice, but I've been using it a lot and it's to stop writing when you're excited. Oh. Because the temptation is to keep writing, writing, writing until you come grinding to a halt and you're like, oh, my well is empty and I, I'm out. And I'll stop yeah. when I'm excited and I will make a few bullet points. I'm like, oh, then I could I could do this and this and this. And I'll, I'll bang them out as bullet points. So then when I start the next day, I'm like, oh, I remember where I was. I wanted to do these things. And then you're straight back into it. And so that's... Do you do any structural planning? I don't. Early on, all the structure's in my head. And I mm. just generate words. But each concept goes into a post-it note. And the post-it notes go onto a wall, which I'm looking at now, which is deeply unhelpful for anyone. But um, anyway, there's some post-it notes that aren't behind the sound baffling. Uh, and so I then physically will structure the book, moving those post-it notes around in the next phase. That's, but that's how only I once I've got enough shows. content. Yeah. yeah. I find that works. Yeah. I probably did pick it up from doing stand up, and then I, that's how I do structure books. But I feel like we've gone into a, a lot of information there. So James, I hope that helps. Give us a shout if you think it's a, yeah. a ding. Also get back to writing. Our next problem comes from Lois. I might be mispronouncing that because there is an umlaut in Lois' name. So apologies oh, if that's incorrect. Lou, Louis. Louis? Hmm. Lois. We'll just go with Lois and we apologise if that's wrong. And the problem is, it's easy to look at a star that is light years away, but I was wondering where on earth you can look the furthest away at something that is also on earth. As in, what's the huh. longest line between yep. two points on Earth that doesn't go through the Earth? And where are those two points? I mean, that's a great question. Yeah. I mean, the first bit's an understatement that it's easy to see a star that's light years away. Like, it's more accurately, it's difficult. Like, it's impossible to see a star that's not light years away. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because all, star, all stars, excluding the sun, pedants, all stars are uh, between four and 4,000 light years Could away. Could you argue that All everything is light years away, but just some of them are very Every, small? On average. Very, very small. Yeah, on increments. average, everything is light years away. Yeah. Yeah. And the Milky Way is like over 100,000 light years across. Maybe it's like 140,000 light years across. And we can only see stars, which are like 4,000 light years away. So we can only see very close by stars. It just so happens that very close in space is And this is light without years. apparatus. But this is the this naked is just eye. With yep. the human yep. eye. Yep. Human eye. Yep. So obviously you can see the sun. That's pretty straightforward. 
and then you can see several thousand stars that are all many, many light years away. And then it did make me think, I kind of, this is not the actual question that Lois asked, but I was thinking, well, how far away, like what's the most distant object you can see with your own eyeball, unaided, just staring at the sky and it's the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, a blimp? I said a blimp. A blimp. <laughs> yeah, no, obviously a blimp is a long way away. I just said a blip. The reason the reason I did double take is you're you are a hundred percent correct if you'd said blip. What? Because actually we can see more distant objects, but not all the time. Because if a supernova goes off in an even more distant galaxy, that's visible to the naked eye. But it just blips. It's it's on and then it's off. Is that its actual terminology? A blip? No. But it's a very good it description. To be one? It should be called a blip. Your wife would be able to put that forward. I know people. I'll 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 get Lucy onto it. Yeah. So no, no, no. I'm serious. Can we get that? Caught? Can we get that done? <laughs> can we get I'm someone on that. on that? Right. We did a teaspoon of trouble. We did that. <laughs> we did the coronavirus thing. Yep, we yep. did a new big press thing. A blip. I wonder. Supernovas seen seen with the naked eye is called a blip. You heard it here first, folks. Like I I actually now I say it out loud. I know some supernovas you see for quite a while i don't know what the fastest supernova is yeah well they're bleeps Bleeps. just more eyes in the bleep got it yeah 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 that's like a 17 eye supernova bleep yeah so the question now is like what's the greatest distance thing you can always it's there and you can see it all the time versus these temporary bleeps when a supernova goes off a very very long way away Mm. but we're talking millions millions of light years with the naked eye incredible Lois's question, however, like obviously it's easy to to look a long way away in space because there's nothing in the way and it's dark. What about something on Earth? And that kind of depends on how tall you are. Because the taller you are, the further away the horizon is. What? And the horizon, by definition, is just how far can you see? Like the horizon's just, I can't see any further. That's the end. And the taller you are, the more... The more horizon uh, you get, or the more distant the horizon. Wait, so if I was to stand in the same place as you yeah. on a beach, like I, I stood in where your footsteps were Dif- on the sand. Yep. I looked at the horizon. I'm looking at a different horizon that you were looking at. Yep. And yours would be n- uh, less impressive, <laughs> for you are shorter than I. <laughs> oh, that's, wait a minute. There might be something right on my, the edge of mine. Yeah, but I would see your Which horizon you and my horizon. I'd see the, the whole thing. Yeah. And this actually, you know what, you kid, but very early on in my relationship with Lucy, this is like the first time we went to Australia. We were both on the beach and we were looking out over the ocean, mm. which is just a superior experience very romantic. in Australia. Yeah. And uh, Lucy said out loud, that was her first mistake. I wonder how far away the horizon is which is basically the same question like how far are we looking what's the greatest distance um that that we can see right now and i was like we can work this out and so i of course i got like a stick and like the sand Uh was quite smooth and so i yeah honestly in the sand you wrote a poem i wrote romantic poem no i i i did a diagram i sketched out the sun i Uh the earth i sketched out the earth and i labeled the radius of the earth and we, we had to estimate it we, you know, we didn't want to look anything up. So it's about 6,000 kilometers. Yeah. So you drew a circle and then you drew a dot inside it. Yeah. You drew a boob. Just the one. Just the one boob. Drew one and then boob. I, then I, then I connected the nipple out as a ray and then I drew the height <laughs> of the person. Honestly. Yeah. This was our romantic moment. Like this is before I, I we were married. It. This is way back in the day. You kids and your hormones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did some Pythagoras, did some very rough working out and calculated yeah. for about our height, the horizon's about five kilometers away. Three miles for Imperial people. Five kilometers for us romantics. Well, obviously Lucy double checked <laughs> afterwards and I was about right. So you impressed her with the calculations. She yep. impressed you with her need for clarification. Yeah, rigorous fact checking. Yeah, 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 <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so it's about, it's about 5K to the horizon if you're about two meters tall. But I've now got a spreadsheet here, so I can put in, I'm 1.84 meters tall. So my my personal horizon is 4.8 kilometers away. My personal horizon is my favorite punk band. <laughs> what's, what's, how tall are you, Beck? 
If you don't mind, uh, I think you've shared this previously. I have, on the yeah, podcast, in a previous. Uh, uh, what, 165 centimeters. 1.65. Boom. Your horizon to the nearest meter says so about four and a half kilometers, just ballpark. Hmm. Specifically, were the ocean perfectly smooth You and you're standing at exactly sea level, you'd be able to see 4,585 meters away. Wow. So there you go. Four and a half K. And then I'd see a little bit further. The thing now is, the higher you get, the further you can see. Yeah. Uh, to a point. Like, you can only ever see half a sphere. So, if you're infinitely far away from the Earth, then you'll be able to see all of one half. And the closer you get, the, the, the closer, Hang the less on. you can see. You can yeah. see half of it. The half closest to you. So, no, if you were... If you were standing on the North Pole, at what point can you see the South yeah, Pole? You can't, ever. Yeah, but that's half of it, isn't it? Well, you could be able to see the top half. You'd be able to see everything from the equator up. So if you're oh, at the North Pole... Oh, yeah. Right. Because you see a quarter yeah, from it. one side and yep. a quarter from the other. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yep. Yeah, you're thinking You're thinking sides. Yeah. I'm forgetting I'm thinking... that someone can turn around and look behind them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you're at the North Pole and you start getting higher and higher and higher up while looking down, yeah. you, if you were infinitely far away, you'd see the, you'd see the equator. Mm -hmm. But if you're any closer, you just see a smaller section of the Earth. Yeah, yeah. And so that's kind of how far away you can see. Although that said, if there's something tall behind the horizon, you can oh, see yeah. that. And that's just the same maths in reverse. Like when someone with a big hat sits in front of you, they get in the way. Exactly <laughs> like when someone, they get in the way. And if you tried to shield them with a horizon, their hat would stick over the horizon. Yeah. So if you were at the beach, Beck, and you're looking out the horizon and you couldn't see someone because they were on, on a boat on the other side mm. and then they put a hat on, you'd be like, oh my goodness, were they? I can see them now. And I'd be like, well, I can see them the whole time because my horizon was better. Yeah. And then um, we'd be back in that whole thing again. So I did the, this, is this sketch. I showed you this before we were, started recording and you said we have to put this on social media. Have you put this into your calculations? At what point can the human eye not tell what a thing is? Oh, I have not. Because it can't just be height. It should also be like just how big it is in general. I have not factored in being able to resolve it. The human eye, and this is me just remembering my astronomy from university, you can see down to about one photon per second. That's where you'll register, oh, there's a thing there. So I haven't done any kind of spatial can you resolve detail? I'm just worried about, can you see it? Like, oh, there's a thing there. There's not a thing there. But I wouldn't be able to see someone with a hat because they would be too no. small. If they had a very bright hat or they had like a mirror on their hat ah. that reflects the sun, so you'd you see a see... glint. Gotcha. I have not factored in the shininess of the hat into any disco of my calculations. Hat. Yeah, if they had a disco hat. I'm going to, yeah, put that, put that calculation online and send it to me. Because I'm going to put the addition of a disco hat Please on. Please do. You can do that. Yeah. And all this is, is the more precise version of what I did for Lucy at the beach. What you did is you worked out, if people go high, they see far. Oh, okay. You say anything in that kind of voice. It sounds really <laughs> obvious. We've been through the spreadsheet. I can tell you exactly how far you can see. And I scaled it up yeah. straight away. So I figured, well, what, what's, what's the max? And Lois specified on earth i figured if you build mm -hmm. something up to space that's probably cheating oh so you're you're gonna count like buildings and stuff yeah it's not yeah people's feet yeah exactly so if you were at like the the line roughly where space starts so you're slightly mm -hmm. higher than where rich and branson went you can see just over two thousand kilometers in every direction you can see about two thousand three hundred kilometers um from from the iss sideways and like Australia, the US, and actually Europe's not far off, are all about 4,000 kilometers across. And Australia and the States okay. are pretty much the same. Yeah. Now I was like, wait a minute, well, this, this kind of makes sense because from the ISS, you can't see all of Australia. Like when the ISS goes over mm. Australia, they can just see red dirt in every direction. Mm. And all the kind mm. of classic photos of the Earth we, we kind of we picture when you think of the view from space... They're like You're Apollo era ones where we went a lot further away and then got the photo. Wait a minute. So you're quite close up. No, there's there's been more recent photos of Earth than Apollo. As in like the Discovery and stuff. Like that kind not the Discovery, but if You just, just picked a name of a satellite. 
You know. Well, you know, they've gone further than... They definitely have, but I don't ones. know if they've turned a camera back at the earth. Okay, so Lauren said the NASA use a new pick and buy... Discover. Discover. See, I was you so close so as well. Close. You made fun of me. No, yeah, you're right. That's That got all of the Earth in the one shot. The Deep Space Climate Observatory. I take it all back, Beck. I want to see it now. Oh, it's stunning. It's bringing a tear to my eye. But I feel like we're, we've now ironically moved too far away from the original question, which was on Earth. Bring us back to Earth, Matt. So I thought I would just do buildings already built. Um, the tallest building is the Baj Khalifa. Is in, in uh, Dubai? Is in Dubai, yep. And it is unbelievably 828 metres tall. Like, it's a kilometre high rounded to the nearest kilometre. Mm. It's just insane, over half a mile up. So if you were at the top of it, 828 metres up, you can see 103 metres away. That's how far away the horizon is. And I was like, that's a long way. And so I had a look on a map to see what can you what's 100 kilometers away from Dubai. And there's not much. But then I realized Abu Dhabi is not that much further away. And so I looked up what the tallest building in Abu Dhabi is. And <gasps> it's the, it's the Baj Muhammad bin Rashid. And that, I mean, it sounds small now. It's 381 meters. That is still a huge building. I'll make that very, very clear. Yeah. It's still nearly 400 meters up. That's like 231 becks. <laughs> so then I worked out if you were at the top of the tallest tower in Abu Dhabi, you could see 70 kilometers in every direction. Which means if there was something on the ground 70 kilometers from Abu Dhabi and 103 kilometers from Dubai, and the two towers are only 122 kilometers apart, which means technically... There's a direct line of sight from the top of the Baj Khalifa in Dubai to the top of the Baj Muhammad bin Rashid in Abu Dhabi. And so then I drew another diagram. And again, it's a rough approximation of those two towers. Again, no hats. You've made the earth very small. I have. Uh, do you know why I picked it that size? It's for a very specific reason. Is it because otherwise it's essentially a straight line? Uh, no, it's because I was using the inside of this roll of tape as my um, stencil. Too. <laughs> Too, there you, not good at drawing circles. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I calculated, and this is just kind of back of the envelope or back of the piece of paper. Your line of sight from one to the other would clear the ground by over two hundred meters, about two hundred and sixty or so. And I think now, now we're within the tolerances of the size I'm estimating the earth is like the radius of the earth and it's different at different places. So if you use exactly 6,371 kilometers of radius of the earth, then you've got a good 260 meter clearance off the ground. It's not going to be that, but I feel like that's enough of a safety that there should be a direct line between the top of these two towers. Now I have been to Dubai. The towers didn't exist when I was there last. Mm. I messaged a friend of mine who not only went up the tower, but was allowed to put on some abseiling kit and climb out of the very top. And what? I don't know if they were allowed to. They were there filming a thing. Uh, it's a guy called Dallas Campbell. You know what? I'll throw him in it. I, was it to do with Mission Impossible? Sadly, no. It was like a documentary oh. about cool buildings. Dallas makes amazing TV shows. And so I messaged him oh, and said, cool. hey, I don't suppose you remember if you could see... Abu Dhabi from the top of the tower while you were up there. And he's replied to say he doesn't remember. He says, most of my attention was on other things. <laughs> I remember thinking, holy expletive, this is really, really high. Direct quote. I've swapped out the word expletive though. Um, so anyway, he says he remembers seeing lots of desert, but he can't recall seeing anything in the distance. He just saw desert as far as you could see. And I looked online and like, there's like one tourist review where someone says they weren't able to see Abu Dhabi, they tried and they couldn't. But now you're coming into your point, like, what can you see? Like, is the tower bright enough at night? Mm. Maybe it's lit. And also, would air quality become an issue? Totally. Because you tend to get more smog as you go yep. higher. The sand and dust off the desert in the air, then that'll block your view. So the answer is, technically, the longest distance would be between these two towers, 
in the United Arab Emirates. However, by all reports, both tourists on the observation deck and my friend Dallas terrified outside the top of the tower, it's not actually visible. But in theory, in optimal conditions, it would be. You don't think the light pollution from closer to you would get in the way of that? I think it would. I think if it, in perfect viewing conditions, you would just be able to see some light coming from it. Now, I have not factored in the light being bent by the atmosphere. I've done all of this calculating straight line distances. This is purely hypothetical. But in theory, that's the longest distance you would be able to see without the light you know, curving in the atmosphere. What if it was not a man-made building, but it was your feet on the ground? Are there two mountains that you could stand on that you would see from further away than if you're standing on a beach looking at the horizon? Oh, that is an interesting question. How far in a mountain range? All the uh, You need to find two isolated mountains because the in-between ones would get in the way mm. um, for the viewing line. Hmm. You know what? I'm open to suggestions. If anyone... I've gone for two human-made towers, but if anyone thinks they can locate mountains or somewhere else with a a greater distance apart... Somewhere natural. Yeah, I'm okay with that. So, Lewis, let us know if that's a ding. And if it's not, any listeners who know of a place with two mountains more than five kilometres away from each other, then let us know. You go to the problem posing page, which is aproblemsquared.com, and uh, select Solution. Beck, a uh, individual named Doug, has a problem with eating cereal. They say, when eating cereal, what is the milk? Question mark. They then offer some options. Sauce, broth, mm-hmm. juice, or something else. Question mark. It's pronounced you. You. Sorry. French. You know. Sorry, I'm pronouncing it again. Sauce, broth, French sauce. Or something else? Question mark. <laughs> so, uh, so there you are. What a problem facing Doug in the morning. Yeah. Yep. Uh, did some research. What? Uh, it, it's milk. <laughs> Good, solid. Wow. I don't know why Doug needs to... It's milk. Fight. Firstly, it's not broth ju- or jus Juche. or gravy even. Oh. It's none of those things. Or soup because those all involve boiling... The ingredients oh, to, okay. to get the flavour out of them. Uh, traditionally, they all start with the bones or the fat. Yep. So depending on what the uh, yeah. on what the thing is, it's not a stock either because a lot of them it's about deriving the the flavour from boiling it. And unless you're boiling your cereal and milk, which I suppose I mean then that's porridge, isn't it? That's what you've yeah. done is you've made some porridge. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to get that. A, a sauce you sort of make out of a, a variety of ingredients to make the sauce. Whereas with, with cereal and milk, you don't, you're yeah. not putting the milk in there to make the, the milk into another thing. It's just milk. So I think the closest I could come to was that it's a bit like cold brew tea. Cold but brew where tea. you eat the thing... You eat the tea. The, the the cereal is the tea in your analogy. Yeah, but where you're eating the thing. But that's why I think it's just milk. But is there any other meal where you immerse what you want to eat in a liquid just for the sake of eating it? Short of putting a pie in some soup. Okay, it's custard. That's what it is. It's custard. It's custard. But what? But, but there's, there's like a category for things like milk or custard or stuff that you just pour on it. I mean, I suppose you could say a custard sauce. Yeah, custard's pretty and saucy. in that sense, yeah. in that sense, maybe you're close to a sauce, but tradi- like a sauce you tend to make out of something. You Like a sauce is made of a lot of different ingredients, whereas milk is milk. So the problem with milk is it's only one ingredient, which means yeah. it's an ingredient, so what you do not a sauce. Is add some stuff to it and then put it uh, over your cereal and you got yourself a sauce. This reminds me a lot of those arguments like, is a hot dog a sandwich? And a lot of the time, all these things is, the answer is, if you have to ask the question, the answer is no. Like, if it's even a question, then no, it's not. So I I Mm. feel like it's not a sauce. It's milk. No, it's milk. It's milk. It's milk. It's a hot dog. It's a hot dog. 
så hot dog course. Ding! <laughs> And we're up for any AOB business. Excellent. A lot of people have sent in suggestions for what I can do with my broken bike helmet. So last episode I mentioned I had an accident on my bicycle. You're not supposed to reuse a helmet once it's been in a crash. It's now been damaged. And We're I was... Go- upcycle you, well, your bicycle you, helmet. That's it. I was going to just throw it out. And you're like, no, upcycle the bicycle helmet. Has a much better ring to it. And so we opened it up. And the most popular suggestion by far was to turn it into a hanging basket. So just it's already got a strap. It's got like holes, I guess, for drainage you just suspend it upside down and put a yeah, plant in chuck there some dirt in whang some jack some dirt in there you're in business however i'm a bit more partial to something sent in by uh, john john says because they used to race bicycles and so they were in you know more crashes than they appreciated probably an above average number of crashes they said whenever they had a damaged helmet they would return it to the manufacturer with a description of what happened So this way, they could use that as like data for like real world tests of their helmets. So now oh. they know, like it was in an actual accident. This is what happened. They can have a look at the helmet to see how it responded and what happened and all that. And um, not only are you providing important data and helping research the safety of helmets, which alone, I mean, I'm already interested. Uh, John then says they got a, the manufacturers would be so grateful they'd give them a discount on their replacement helmet. So I have already ordered my replacement. In fact, I've got it and I've worn it while cycling. But I think that's amazing. And so I am going to do that. I'm going to post it. I guess I just write a handwritten note. Here's what happened. Tuck it in the, <laughs> tuck it in the helmet. <laughs> Pop it in yeah. the post. Stick a stamp on it. Stamp right on the helmet. Pop a flower in <laughs> for good luck. Put, put PS. Feel free to use it as a hanging basket once you're done. That seems yep. to be the most popular option. Put How some seeds it? in the sweaty foam bits in the yeah. inside, see if they sprout while it's on its way. Exactly. So there you go. So that's great suggestion. I'm glad I listened to you, Beck, and I didn't throw it out straight away. I'm going to send it back to the manufacturer and uh, regale them with the tale of how I fell off my bicycle. I might just include a link to the previous episode. Yeah, just send them a link. L- listen yeah. to episode 021. That's all you need. Here's the helmet. You have to let us know how you get on. Have fun. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please remember to tell your friends, share links, give us reviews, whatever it is. You can also subscribe to us on Patreon if you want to help us out financially. And if you have any problems or solutions, you can log them at aproblemsquared.com. We'll be tweeting about some of the stuff we've discussed in this show, uh, also posting on Instagram, and we'll be asking for your advice on some of these as well. So if you'd like to know what other people do to keep writing fun and interesting or how other people eat their cereal or anything like that, check us out at A Problem Squared and uh, let's get a conversation going. Or indeed, if you're a Patreon supporter, you can chat about it there. And just before we go, if people do want to see the new dodecahedron, it'll be on my YouTube channel. Some closure there for everyone. Oh, and finally, Beck, in in just the chat on our video call, uh, here's... Mm. Oh, it won't let me paste that prime number. Ah, oh, I went and got... I've got all 4,030 digits. It's just making an error noise. Oh, what a oh, shame. Oh, no. You are missing it. Don't worry, I'll, I'll email it to you afterwards. Thanks again for our wonderful producer, Lauren Armstrong Carter, and to me. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Beck. Mm. Is this your card? I forgot what my card was. Oh, my.